will start and I'm just going to give a quick introduction about uh, the class and then talk about who I am. Most of you know who I am and then I'll turn it over to Maria and she can talk a little bit about her background and then we've got just some talking points that we'd love to chat about with you and then love this to be as, as interactive as possible. So feel free to type questions into the question pod and, uh, and if you want at the end we'll save some time. So if any of you want to come up on audio or video you'll have the opportunity to do that. First of all, can everybody hear me okay? Good. Looks good. Okay, so um, my name is John Bischke. I'm the CEO, founder of EduFire. Um, we started this company back in 2007. Prior to starting EduFire, I was involved in helping to start uh, three different businesses. One company doing Microsoft and Cisco training online back during the the Glory dot com days. Um, another company that was the social network in the green space. So basically, MySpace for people into organic foods and and hybrid cars and saving the environment. Um, and then also a company called Learn Out Loud, which is a destination site for people interested in audio learning. So uh, audiobooks, podcasts, all sorts of great audio content uh, if you want to learn history, politics, business, um, and you want to do it through through listening versus reading. So those are my things in my background. And we started EduFire in 2007 as a platform to give teachers an opportunity to be able to teach live classes over the internet. So we've had over uh, 5,000 teachers and 50,000 students sign up to date. There have been over 10,000 sessions or, or, or classes conducted on EduFire. And we've been growing and growing. And we started with language training. And then we added test prep. And more recently, we launched a, a business channel. And we recruited a whole bunch of uh, really cool entrepreneurs and VCs to come on board and, and join us. So Maria is one of them. So I'm going to kick it over to her to talk a little about who she is and, and Skimble. And then we'll dive into the subject of pursuing your passion through business. Hi guys, I'm Maria Lee and I'm the co-founder of Skimwell. Uh, we've launched uh, last month actually, so we're sort of a new startup. Um, we have been working on a site to help you plan, track, and discover your active life. Um, I co-founded it with um, Gabriel Van Rennen and together we make up the team. <laughs> uh, last year we uh, considered you know, doing something that we were truly passionate about and you know, this is the way that Skimble kind of formed and shaped itself. Uh, prior to Skimble, I have been working um, in product and marketing at Google, uh, Flurry, and Cyprus. So my background is uh, computer engineering, uh, minoring in management science, and com um, international studies. So I'm actually from Canada, uh, but I've made my way uh, out to San Francisco to pursue my passion. We've got, we've got a few people here in the in the office with us, so if you see us looking around and doing anything, it's probably because someone in the room is uh, doing something. So, um, well, so I want to I want to start, um, and we'll, we'll probably just ask each other questions throughout the course of the the class today. But um, I guess I'd love to start with hearing kind of how you guys got the idea for Skimble, and kind of when was that moment where you were like, okay, this is this is what we're going to do. We're we were passionate about this, and uh, and now we actually want to turn this into a business. So when did that happen? Sure. Um... So way back when, I've always been, you know, involved in um, athletics. Um, I was a former gymnast, uh, and I came out to San Francisco and learned to rock climb, as well as, you know, practice yoga and Pilates, that sort of stuff. Um, and I've always wanted to do something where I could track all of my activities, and there wasn't really something out there um, that actually catered to my needs. And so, you know... I actually took about a year off, uh, kind of to this day, uh, half a year was spent in Asia where I uh, came up kind of with the idea with my co-founder Gabe and, you know, we were being active and, you know, using a prototype to track our activities and when we came back, back to uh, San Francisco, we thought, you know, hey, we could probably turn this into like a real business where, you know, people can use our tools to track their activities, whatever sports they do, whatever activities they, they're passionate about. Um, so that was what kind of formed. And, you know, during the summer, I participated in um, this program called the Founder Institute, where um, it's, it's a bit of a, like a four-month incubator program for early stage startups. Uh, founder centric and you know through that we, we try to figure out you know what is the the business behind you know being active and traveling and we found that there was one so that's why we're pursuing it and we've just launched so 
It's awesome. It's just the beginning. <laughs> I know, and that's always the fun part too. Like when you just get going, and like you uh -huh. know, kind of the sky's the limit. Anything's for possible. For sure. And you you've done Edufire for about two years now. Yeah. So we started What's in two thousand seven. My story with our story with Edufire. So I've been a teacher before. Uh, I've taught for places like Kaplan. If you're familiar with Kaplan, the test prep company taught uh, SAT and GMAT and ACT. Uh, that was back when I was in college. Uh, my first job, my first real job out of college was teaching for Microsoft. I taught the, mm -hmm. some of the Microsoft <coughs> technologies back when Windows 2000 was just coming out back in like 1999. And um, you know, for me, it was always this kind of experience of being in the classroom, really enjoying teaching. But one mm -hmm. of the things that always frustrated me about teaching is, is you can only reach a limited audience. So, <coughs> excuse me. So you could you know, teach a great class to eight people. And it was awesome for those eight people who were in that class. But you know, if you were teaching in a class, there are probably a lot of other people who'd be interested in taking that class as well. So one of the things I spent a lot of time thinking about is how can you use technology to allow a teacher to reach a larger audience. And, and I actually started my first company based off of that because I was really passionate about helping people to um, you know find new jobs in information technology. And, and this was back in the you know the days when everybody wanted to be in IT. Mm -hmm. It was the hot space to be in. And so we created this website, and it was really geared around people, geared for people who wanted to get a job in, in IT, wanted to go through the certification process, which is in Microsoft, uh, Microsoft what was known as the MCSE, but they didn't have a ton of money to be able to actually do that on their own. So we set up a series of websites for them that would help them go through that process of going from you know a salesperson or a career in marketing or something, a service job, into getting their first job in IT, getting their Microsoft certification, getting up to skill, up to speed with all the skills that they needed. And it really was kind of started almost by accident uh, and you know really grew very fast. And I think that first experience of seeing what the web could do, what technology could do, and kind of how it could empower um, you know, someone's passion was really impactful for me. And then it kind of took, you know, seven, eight years for me to go from that experience to starting Edufire. But I think during that whole time, it's kind of just been this thing in the back of my mind about how do you use technology in innovative ways to help people teach. Um, because I had been a teacher and I had seen some of the, both, you know, the joys of teaching as well as some of the frustrations. Mm -hmm. So um, one question, we've got a few things that we've written down here in advance of the class, but um, uh, one of the questions here is, is how do you know when something you love can or should be more than just a hobby? So everyone out there has hobbies, things they're passionate about, but at what point do you say, actually, this could be a business? So what are your thoughts on, on that? Um, so for me, you know, with Skimble, it's at the intersection of active sports and travel. Um, for, for me, when I started the, the alpha, if you will, um, prototype, was actually a site to track your rock climbs um, and you know that niche itself was kind of underserved for you know the socially engaging you know kind of site that I was uh, interested in developing and from that you know a bunch of my friends tried it out with just their rock climbing and that feedback you know fueled me to to do more with that um, the platform that we, we started developing was pretty cool and um, it wasn't too difficult for us to incorporate some of the other sports that we really enjoyed and like I mentioned I love to you know practice yoga I love to hike trek um, that sort of stuff so you know it just began to expand and I think now we've we support like 20 sports and you know we, I think we're just releasing skiing and snowboarding so that will be interesting for the holidays yeah. or yeah for the winter season um, so yeah, um, it started small because we wanted to prove our product, prove that there was um, you know, a need for something that um, helped you track your activities over time, plan trips, that sort of thing. Um, but then when we thought about it, you know, the active outdoor recreational kind of economy um, was underserved. It's, you know, I, when I try to find stuff uh, for me, like just to plan trips or you know, logging my activities, online um, it, it was a frustrating you know kind of process and right now I think that market is a little underserved for technology you know social technology that is really engaging and um, kind of fun mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think after you know running a bit of an alpha you know we figured out that there was a need for this um, and of course we did our market research where you know some of the statistics running surveys that sort of stuff really point in that kind of direction. Yeah, no, I think that that's, that's really smart. I mean, 
one of the things and I see in our notes here around you know there has to be a market. I think you know a lot of times when people have something they're passionate about, it doesn't necessarily automatically equate to a business, Definitely right? Not. I mean, you know, it's something where you know I can be really passionate about you know underwater basket weaving, and if I'm like <laughs> one of eight people in the world that does that, then uh, <laughs> do you have a category for that on Skimble yet? Not yet. <laughs> Added to the list. <laughs> well, pretty far down the list. Okay. Um, you know, it's one of those things where that doesn't necessarily equate to a market, but then it's it's surprising too because sometimes you see things where um, um, like there's these, uh, you know, quilting websites and things like right. that now that are huge and have like tremendous amounts of traffic. And, you know, it might not be something that people would look at and go, wow, there's a great business there. Or like when um, when uh, Ted started like Dogster and created a social network mm -hmm. for people's pets. Like I'm sure a lot of people thought he was kind of crazy. <laughs> and, and now look at how well Dogster and Catster and all these other sites that he started as spinoffs have done. So um, I think it is hard sometimes to know. And if you're, you're really passionate about something, it's surprising sometimes how you can turn into a business. But I do think it's really important to do to do that market research. Scrapbooking, yeah, Ted mentioned scrapbooking. <laughs> I think that's another another one that's just a massive, massive business. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, oftentimes gets ignored, you know, because oftentimes, you know, there's people – you know, a lot of tech businesses get started by people where we are, people in the Bay Area. And, uh, and you know, with, with the Bay Area, like, sometimes we're in a little bit of a bubble and we think everyone else does exactly what we do. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe not a lot of people in the Bay Area do scrapbooking, but if a lot of people in Nebraska do scrapbooking, well, there's the there's your market right there. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's really it's really interesting. Um, <laughs> Koichi. Koichi says, he's surprised, he's surprised at how much he uses underwater basket weaving to embark the edgy fire. <laughs> You have, have to teach a class on that underwater gorilla basket weaving marketing. For now, he's sweet. <laughs> so, um, one question that that also comes up a lot with with pursuing passionate businesses, you know, a lot of times people will do their businesses as kind of a, a sideline gig or moonlighting. They'll have a, a day job and then they'll start their their business that they're passionate about as kind of a, an offshoot of that. Um, and then there kind of gets to be this this moment of decision where you have to say, okay, I'm ready to to quit my day job, I'm going to launch full bore into that. Yes. Um, so first of all, it sounds like that's what you guys have done or are in the process of doing with Skimble. Yes, yeah, so um, I think my passion sort of took over my life um, just a couple years ago where, uh, you know, I was toying with the idea of doing something that was much more focused on that passion than anything else that I was doing. Um, and when the time was right, I actually had saved, you know, some money and yeah. um, I sold my car and I took a year off. I traveled in Asia where it was very cheap. The cost of living was very low. And when I came back to San Francisco, you know, I'm here now working out of my apartment and I am doing everything that I possibly can to help keep my costs low. Um, and that's been able to help me work on Skimble full time and really, um, you know, extend my runway. Um, what about no, I, you? I think, I think that, that's a really <laughs> smart thing. I think one of the things that I noticed, um, so f with, with me, I, have, I haven't had a day job for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think the last time I actually worked for, for a salary was when I was probably 20 two or 23 mm -hmm. uh, was a long time ago but you know I was fortunate to have a couple things to be successful earlier on which then was able it was able to use those um, you know funds from the sales of a couple companies to fund other companies which is sure. always fun but one of the things that I noticed kind of along these lines was um, I went to business school um, in 2003 at UCLA and when I went to business school it was funny because business school was uh, you know, everyone who came into business school didn't want to do whatever they were doing before business school. So if they were a consultant, you wanted to be a banker. If you were a banker, you wanted to start your own company. If you, you had your own company before, you wanted to become a consultant, I guess. <laughs> um, and what was really interesting was actually there were a lot of people um, the first few weeks of business school who were like, I'm here. I'm going to start a company. You know, this is exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to use business school to like as that break from whatever I was doing. I'm going to start a business. And then what happened over the next year or two is is that all of us, they'd see that the jobs they were being offered – after business school were much better than what they had before business school and salaries mm -hmm. were higher and the signing bonuses were there and so a lot of people said ah you know I was going to start my own company but McKinsey gave me a good offer Goldman gave me a good offer and I've got to go and do that so I think one of the things to really think a lot about 
is um, you know your opportunity cost of starting a company, mm -hmm. and you know when you're younger, your opportunity cost is a lot lower. You know you have you yeah you could go work at a job, but you know most people who are younger they're not going to be making huge amounts of money working. So why not start a company? You know your risks are a lot lower too. You don't have a lot of expenses. You can live a lot more more cheaply, and you know you get older and you have a mortgage and kids and things like that, and, and starting a business is really you know is really tough to do. So I do think that that the decision about when to break, you know, kind of go in and do this full time, like the earlier in life you do this, and I always, you know, if I speak to groups of entrepreneurs, I always say, you know, take as many risks as you can as early as you can, because the older you get in life, the harder it is to, to do it. So uh, I think that's a really big part of, of when to make that leap is is try to do it, you know, as, as early in your life as you can, uh, better late than never, but definitely as early in life as, ca as you can. Mm -hmm. I just like it's expensive. <laughs> well, yeah, I think Jeff's yeah. talking about. I, mean, I think you're probably talking <laughs> about movie production. Um, yeah, and you know, a lot of the so a lot of the dreams too. Like one of the things that's important to realize is, is that they don't always happen exactly the way that you think they're going to happen. And sometimes when you pursue your, pursue your passion, you may start down one path, and you may find that that path isn't the right path. Maybe you start a company and, and you, know, you have some difficulty having it find traction or whatever. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't. You should stop pursuing your passion. It might just be a different way that you go about pursuing your passion in the future. So uh, that's something to think about as well. Um, so another question that, that, that we had on our list is, is what kind of support system should you have to maximize your success rate? So do you want to talk a little about your support sure. system? Sure. Um, as I mentioned, I came out to San Francisco uh, a, a, a few years ago, three years ago. And um, one of the main reasons was because I loved technology and, you know, the Silicon Valley still does exist, even though, you know, we're in a bit of a down economy. But, you know, all of the VCs are out here, a lot of the startups are out here, and um, just the environment has been really, um, you know, supportive of anything that you do. Like, if you're going to do your own company, uh, it's not to say you can't do it anywhere else, but I think um, in, you know, the Silicon Valley area, um, there are a lot of um, mechanisms in place to help you um, so that, you know, you feel that you're not just the only one because there are tools out there, there are other startups, you know, that you can, you know, meet up with, people, you know, founders, um, networking events, that sort of thing. So um, I think like when I came out here, what I really wanted to do was meet people, um, and in particular people that were also doing kind of like the, the thing that they were passionate about um, and taking the path less traveled by. Um, and I think that was that was really good because I did meet, you know, quite a few people that, you know, I've really connected with in that sense. Um, you know, back in, I guess, maybe my high school days, I was always sort of do my own thing too. Um, I started with like a cell phone accessories business and, you know, um, was doing that on the side and was involved in entrepreneurship at an early age. But that, that um, sense of entrepreneurship has, you know, followed through throughout college um, and then into my, you know, post uh, college uh, life and connecting with people that are like that really helps um, and also I mentioned the tools so you know I've participated in the Founder Institute for example where they give you a lot of um, access to mentors um, who are actually like very well proven CEOs that have done a lot of stuff either in like Web.0 you know um, Web2 uh, and, and are, currently, you know, in yet another entrepreneurial role where they're founding, you know, their next company. So um, that has been really good because we get to, you know, get in contact with those guys and learn from them, their mistakes even, and um, hopefully not repeat. So then that's been really good. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of services out there that are very favorable to startups and, you know, entrepreneurs. And, you know, there's discounts, there's, you know, plenty of opportunities where you can just get out there, meet people, and, you know, just evangelize. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Y Combinator, the Founder Institute, FB Fund, there's, there's many of them, and a lot of them are out here, um, and I think that's been very valuable. Yeah, I mean, the incubators yeah. like, like Y Combinator and, and Founder Institute, Techstars, um, you know, there have been a number mm -hmm. of Betaworks, 
there have been a number of, of these that have spawned in the last two or three years, and they've been really successful. Um, there's been a number of companies that have come out of them that have done really well. There have been, you know, a lot of people who, even if maybe they went to, um, you know, one of the companies and didn't work out, then they've joined another company. Yep. And so it's really been interesting to see. And, and the other thing, too, to, to mention about things like Y Combinator and, and the Founders, Founder Institute is that, you know, a lot of times they get kind of get the rap that it's just for people out, right out of school, you know, people that are just recent college grads. And that's really not the case. There's a lot of people that are, I don't know what the age range was in, in Founder Institute. Oh, it totally varied. Like, yep. there were people in their 20s. I'm in my 20s. Mm -hmm. um, and also people in their 30s, too. Yep. Um, it's founder-centric. So whatever, when you have an idea and, you know, you want to pursue it and figure it out, you know, you can participate in any of these types of, you know, incubator mm -hmm. programs or, you know, even the less uh, formal ones where there are a lot of events that you mm -hmm. can just go to and start building that network and learning. Yeah, yeah, I think that 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 that's one of the biggest things that I typically tell people. You know, if if they're asking kind of how do I get down the path of being entrepreneurs, you really want to surround yourself with other entrepreneurs, yeah. and and you want to surround yourself with other peers. And, and this is why I think stuff like the Founder Institute and Y Combinator and everything are so successful, is because they kind of give you this peer group of other people who are all going through it together. In fact, Paul Graham just wrote a recent essay. I don't know if if we can find um, kind of on what was surprising about being in a startup, and it was a really really cool essay. And, you know, one of the things that, that, you know, I talked about is just how it's very, very tough to be in a startup, but it's always a lot easier if you're around other people who are also going through that together. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, going to war. Like, it's not easy, but, you know, you know, if you're going to war and you have other people around you, at least you can kind of share the, <laughs> share the, uh, the experience with some other people. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's exactly it. it. Thanks, Lily. Um, so, you know, I think that that's a really cool thing to do. And then the other thing that they're doing both Y Combinator and Founder Institute, I'm sure Techstars and other ones, is they're giving you access to entrepreneurs who've done it before. Yeah. And I think that's the other thing that's really important is have not just a peer group around you that are other people doing things entrepreneurially, but also be able to look at someone who's one step, two steps, three steps ahead of you and go, mm -hmm. wow, like that person sold two companies, I haven't sold any, like what can I learn from that person? Mm -hmm. The quickest way I think to, to become successful is to find people who have succeeded in what you're trying to do and kind of learn the lessons that they've learned as quickly as possible. So I do think that these these groups are great. Now, you may not have access to one of these groups. You may you know not be able to get into one of them. They're very selective. You may live in a part of the world where they, there isn't uh, a group and so, you know, I think the next best thing that you can do is is try to do f some virtual networking mm -hmm. and find people, you know, whether it's through Facebook or LinkedIn or blogs or Twitter, and just reach out to them and try to. And I've had, you know, a number of people through my blog and through my experience with Edufire who've written me and they've said, hey, you know, can you mentor me? And then you know, I can't, unfortunately, I can't take the time to do that with everybody. But I've definitely tried to help, and, I, and I'm an advisor to a few startups, and um, you know, it's definitely I, people have done the same for me. Yeah, like um, just to add to that, um, I think it's very valuable for you um, to have a mentor that is maybe more startup focused, but also to have a mentor that's more personal. So, you know, the head and the heart mentor, um, to have people in your life where you can just go to them and talk about, you know, specific things um, about your startup, or even like, oh, am I doing my long, if, am I like reaching goals for like long term? you know, fulfillment. Um, because, hey, even if you have a startup now, that might not be the same startup you're working on five years from now. Um, and everything that you're learning, um, it's great to have, like, a support group to really, like, bounce ideas off of and, and just to talk things through and figure out, like, you know, am I doing the right thing? Um, mm -hmm. I think that's very useful. Yeah, I, I think that that's... And there's been... A, and lately, there have been a number of... of uh, things that I've seen that I've been recommending to people um, on startups.com mm -hmm. has something called Answers Now, which is um, it's kind of a Q&A for entrepreneurs. So people go on there, they can ask questions. Um, there's the Funded, which is the, the Founder Institute, um, Adeo. Adeo Resi, yeah. yeah he he created the funded. Really cool, especially if you're out raising money, you can go in mm -hmm. there and you can find out what people are saying about different uh, angel exactly. investors and VCs. Um, one that I I read fairly religiously nowadays is Hacker News, which is why Combinators um, kind of filter for for stories about being a you know in a startup or being an entrepreneur. There's some really good stuff there. So there are tons of these resources out there that that exist now for people who are doing their own thing that just make it so much easier than it used mm -hmm. to be um, you know and then there's all sorts of podcasts like Stanford has their entrepreneurial thought leaders podcast right. um, there's venture voice there's mixergy there's you know there's all these you know interviews with people um, that's the other one from scratch 
is really good. So there's all this stuff out there right now that, you know, I, I you know, when I speak at like a college, I'll just tell people, you know, you should listen to every single episode of Pro Thought Leaders, every <laughs> single episode of Venture Voice, every single episode of Mixergy, and yep. every single episode of From Scratch. And, you know, you just kind of absorb the lessons of other people. So. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, okay. So, you know, it's great to pursue your passion, but, you know, I think some people are worried or can get worried about, you know, that failure where maybe your startup doesn't work um, or if they've done the wrong thing or what they perceive as the wrong thing after the fact. You know, it's very difficult to leave, you know, a comfortable job for, for many. And, you know, as many people have mentioned, like, how, if it's just a hobby, you know, maybe it should just stay a hobby and not mess up my, my whole life, not mess up my maybe routine even. Um, so maybe, like, John, if you've had any examples of times where, you know, you had to turn around or do something yeah. different. Maybe not an exact failure, but a yeah. challenge. Well, we had we had a, a, you know, a really interesting situation with one of the companies that I helped get off the ground called Sods, mm -hmm. where you know we we started the company and, and I was wasn't involved um, kind of in the early days. A couple of my friends who got off the ground, I had invested in the company, and and then they needed someone to come on board and kind of run operations. So I joined the company as the president, and we started growing the company, and we really looked like it was going to take off, and, and we had grown the team out to, I think, 13 or 14 employees. And then we get to just, we got to a certain point in time, we just hit a wall. And, and you know, we thought we were going to be able to raise some more money, and we couldn't, and we thought the technology was going to work, and it didn't. And we actually had to kind of almost reboot the entire company. So we went from, I think, 13 or 14 people back down to two, mm -hmm. uh, which was a really painful process you know some people who had you know quit jobs and things like that to come work for us um, and we, we were at the point where we didn't know really if the business was going to move forward and then kind of at the last minute we found this angel investor who really believed in the business and wrote a big check for us and then we were able to reboot the company and, and ultimately you know became very successful and was acquired but it was that I think you know uh, the determination and specifically of, of the uh, the one individual who founded the company originally where he just wouldn't let it die, you know. And mm -hmm. It was at that point where it would look like very, very bleak, like there was no future, and, you know, there's just that determination to stick through it. But I think that, you know, kind of more generally on the subject of failure, one of the things that I feel is that most people are really not scared of failing. They're scared of what will people think of them if they fail or if they mm -hmm. fail. Um, because when you look at it, like if you're smart enough to be a founder of a company and have the energy to do that, you're probably you're qualified for 95% of the jobs that are out there. Like uh -huh. any, I mean, that energy, that drive, that ambition, like you could probably do anything. So it's not like if you found a company, you fail, you know, you're going to be like living on a you know, cardboard box in the street somewhere. Like it's just that that's probably not going to happen to anybody. So I think what people are really scared of with failure is not so much like the, the, the net impact of failure. It's that people are going to look at them and say, oh, you tried that and it didn't work out, you know, and if you can, if people can get around that and they can kind of allow themselves to say, look, if that's the worst case scenario that like I'm worried about what people think of me, then then failure becomes a little bit more manageable. Mm -hmm. um, if you can just kind of say, okay, I, I can deal with that and, and realize that most of the people who've done anything worth doing, big successful people have had at least one if not many failures in their lives. And so failure oftentimes, you, you, you've heard this before, but you learn way more from your failures than from your successes. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very true. Yeah, so. I think Lily mentioned um, or did ask me what what were the big differences between my life now and that life that I, I led when I was working at Google. So to give you just a bit of background, you know, I completed my college um, education um, through a cooperative education program where every four months I was actually working at a, another company. Um, and so throughout the course of, you know, my five years of studies, I accumulated two years of work experience. Um, and that was really nice where I got work experience from big companies, medium-sized companies, that sort of thing. But then when I got out of college, you know, in, my, in the back of my mind, I knew I wanted to come out to San Francisco because a couple of my work terms prior were, you know, in the Bay Area. Um, but I also knew that I wanted to pursue like a startup of my own. But of course, you know, there are different opportunities that come um, into play right out of college. And... You know, I took the offer to work at Google on their international product management team. Um, and that was a very good experience. 
um, a lot of people uh, were, you know, uh, that I met there have become very valuable and, you know, um, I developed long-lasting friendships through that experience and, you know, they have a nuclear program which is great and, you know, being able to come out here not knowing anybody um, and to meet people, um, I thought that was a really good choice. Now, did I fail because I quit Google? Well, some people were really surprised when I left. They're like, what? You know, no more free lunches? That sort of thing. Um, are you kidding me? Like, that, that's like, isn't that the number one company to work at? And then, you know, I just had to chuckle because people, you know, can, can form uh, opinions of you, like, maybe, you know, um, could be positive or negative. But uh, the people that really knew me were not surprised because I think they knew me... Uh, they really know me as a character who is very, um, I guess, energetic. And, you know, I, if, even if I take what looks to be like, you know, the, the generic path to success or, you know, your career path, you know, um, I was eventually going to deviate to something incredibly awesome. <laughs> so um, I really don't consider that a, a failure to get out of, you know, big corporate life. Uh, but I think it did take um, a bit of preparation and mental training to say, you know, it's about time to leave and I know why I wanted to um, and have those uh, concepts, you know, ingrained in your mind so that you know that you made the right decision mm -hmm. and not look back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that definitely knowing why you're doing what you're doing is really, is really critical. I think that for a lot of people, you know, there's, there's, you know, the, the starting of a, just like anything else in life, starting a company can be something that you get caught up into too. And I think mm -hmm. I see, you see this in the Bay Area more than you probably see at other places, but, you know, where, you know, it's like, oh, like all my friends are starting companies, so I need to start a company. <laughs> and, you know, that's probably not a good idea. Um, there's so much energy and, and, you know, time that's required to start something that you really need to start it because it's what you truly want to do. Um, I used to have long conversations with a friend of mine around this kind of concept of starting a business from the outside in versus inside out. And mm -hmm. it basically was that, you know, an outside in business is one where you look at a market and you say, okay, you know, there's all these industries out there. Let's look at an industry where there's, you know, a bunch of money being made that I can yeah. kind of sneak in and get a certain percentage market share. It might be something I don't even care about, but you're like, wow, there's a big opportunity. And that was kind of the outside in approach. And it's the approach that's taught oftentimes in business school and things like that. The inside in out approach is completely opposite. It's, it's kind of this notion of like, what am I passionate about or what kind of change do I want to see in the world and let me create a company around that. And it's not always as easy to, to figure out kind of how you do that, right? Because there's not as clear of a template possibly. But I think it's always more fun and more mm -hmm. rewarding and you're much more likely to stick with it because it's something that's truly about you. So, <coughs> excuse me, Lily says, um, or Lily asks, if your passion is your business and your business is your passion, how do you maintain work-life balance? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can start. That's a good one. <laughs> well, I, I would say, uh, for me, I would say that it's, and I, I don't remember, I'm ripping this off from somebody else, but they said it's more about work-life integration yeah. than work-life balance. So I think that, you know, I some people, people will ask me, you know, how often or how many hours a week do you work? And I, for me, it's really tough to actually give a good answer to that because I don't necessarily split my waking hours into work and play or work and life. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I go and I go up for a jog in the morning, is that work or is that play? Well, it's, you know, some people say, well, that's not work, but if it causes me to think more clearly or be less stressed or, or whatever, um, be more energetic throughout my day, then actually it is benefiting me just the same as like sitting down and cranking out a bunch of emails, maybe even more. So I think that it, you kind of start, uh, from what I've seen from the people who are really successful at being entrepreneurs, you kind of start blurring the line a little bit between you know what you're doing for fun and what you're doing for work. And oftentimes that's just because what you do for work is as much fun as what you do for, for fun. One of my favorite quotes is uh, this guy, I think it was, I can't remember the guy's name, Noel Coward or something like that, and it's, work is more fun than fun. And for, I think, a lot of entrepreneurs, it's true. Like Sometimes they enjoy what they do for their business more than what they do when they're not doing their business. So I don't know if you have any more thoughts on that one. Definitely. Um, I think for me, uh, it's actually a lot of fun to blend the two because I love to be active and I think that kind of lifestyle to choose to be active, um, you know, whether it be, you know, going for a run or, you know, practicing yoga, it definitely 
refreshes my mind. And you know, back you know at my desk, uh, at my computer, wherever I am, I can really crank out stuff. Um, I love it when I wake up and I think of something that's great, and you know, another little piece in, into the the vision, the puzzle that you know what I what I really want to create with Skimble. That feeling is great, and you know, I will power through you know a few hours and just you know work on that while you know I'm in the zone. <laughs> that I think that kind of um, passion for the thing that you're doing when it takes you. I just run with it. It doesn't really matter. I mean, I, I'm not going to drop like everything that I do, but sometimes I will um, because that's when you can really, you know, use that energy and hash out, you know, whatever you, that uh, it is that you're working on, in, you know, in your in your startup life. Um, but of course, you know, I take a lot of time to just chill out and, you know, if I'm, you know, on a beach in Hawaii. Well, I could be, you know, also <laughs> handing out Skimble bookmarks or something like that, whatever. <laughs> There's always more to be done, right? There is, yeah. there is. Well, I think one of the things, too, is, is that I find with, with you know, what, where I work the best is oftentimes when it's less about putting in a certain number of hours or certain hours, but more about working if I feel like working and not working if I don't feel like working. I know that that sounds a little bit slackerish, mm -hmm. but but I really feel that that you know there are times when I can go 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 and then there's times when my body or my brain just says no moss, you know, like yeah, like definitely. slow down a bit and and it's in those times where I think and it's a very intuitive feel where oftentimes the best ideas will come. And you know the, the the insights come when you're like you step back for a bit, you know, and you go for that run. And I love, I'm very jealous of the fact that for you, the going outdoors and doing things and being very active is really integrated into your business. Like you Quite. couldn't you couldn't like not rock climb and be doing what you're doing, which is awesome because uh -huh. I think when you're rock climbing, like what better place to get ideas and inspiration, right, mm -hmm. than on top of a mountain somewhere. So, I agree. Um, just to add to Ted's comments. You know how is it? How important is it um, that your co-founders also share that passion of yours? So, number one, I think they should be passionate about something, and hopefully, if it's something similar, that's great. Um, now, for example, with my co-founder Gabe, he's not going to go to a yoga session, like practice yoga. Probably not. But there's other ways that you know he loves being it's great, you know, active. Gabe. It really is. It's really fun. <laughs> it's I go all the time. <laughs> But, you know, he won't really join me. I think I've dragged him to the gym or uh, to a studio once. <laughs> there, there. He's, he's uh, said it there. Um, but uh, one thing that's, I think, really important is, yes, share a, a certain passion that's related to your business, but also have complementary skill sets. So this is very important for co-founders. It's, it's really critical um, for startups um, to have co-founders that have very complementary skill sets. Um, now, for me, my background was more hardware engineering, uh, but you know, Skimble is more of a software site right now. And uh, so, one one great thing with my co-founder Gabe is that he has um, a very strong technical background, um, as well as you know, product and, and marketing that sort of thing. You know, that's been very helpful. But you know, for us, because I'm more on the product side, um, you know, the front end, uh, that sort of thing, it's been very beneficial for us as we work you know, very lean, there's only two of us right now, um, that we have complementary skill sets. Mm -hmm. I think that definitely helps us work quickly and, you know, um, crank out whatever uh, we need to be working on. And we don't have to outsource so much, you know, work. Um, and I think that's very important. So be passionate, but also, you know, for co-founders, have people surrounded, um, surrounding you that have really good assets, um, skills, that sort of thing. That's very important. And I want to get to, uh, to Joseph's question here too, which was, do startups always have to start with a great idea? People don't seem to want to get on board unless you come up with one. So, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, you know, obviously a big part of being a startup is being able to recruit talented mm -hmm. people to join you. So, you know, kind of it's a little bit of a chicken egg thing sometimes where, you know, without the idea, you can't get the people. But then, oftentimes, people are the ones who contribute really depth to the idea. So, mm -hmm. how did what, what have you found? Um, how did you and Gabe meet? Well, uh, we meet at we met at a surprise birthday party at my um, apartment. My <coughs> roommate, my ex roommate Joyce, um, knew both of us, so she did the introduction. And I was just starting to rock climb at that time. And Gabe had been rock climbing for a few years, 
Um, and I think we went to the gym a few times together, you know, with friends and that sort of thing. Um, and we went outdoors on like this big Tahoe trip. And that was great, you know, really opened my eyes to like um, the sport, but also to the people and the kind of community that I think is, is very important in that um, kind of lifestyle, the rock climbing lifestyle. Um, and I totally embraced that. Um, I think that it was really good that we, we met prior and then, you know, built a friendship and understood like, you know, how we work in business. So when we decided, hey, you know, we're gonna do something together, we felt very confident that that was the right team that the two founders, you know, together could could really, you know, work things out and not have too many surprises. It's I think it's I've heard that it's been very hard to find co-founders who you might not have known prior and I think it's very important to build the network so that you can potentially find a co-founder in your network whether they might have the same similar idea or want to be in a certain industry in a space. Um, I think that's pretty important. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, Lily put a good link dating. here. Yeah, founder dating. Um, a good friend Sarger is doing that right now. Really cool. Um, also, Venture Hacks, which if you don't read Venture Hacks, highly recommend reading it. Very good blog. Uh, they're doing a survey right now, which is basically how did you meet your co-founder? And I'm sure when they're done with it, they'll be publishing the results. It should be really interesting to see. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to see that kind of at scale. Um, I think one of the things, because Joseph, you had another follow-up, which was how do you convince them? I think one thing mm -hmm. is is work on something meaningful. You know, I think so many people nowadays are very, um, they're very kind of, what's the word, kind of cynical about business, and they've seen some of the you know scandals and you know, bailouts and things like that. Mm -hmm. And people are really excited about working on a business that that makes people's lives better. You know, so whether that's you know finding a cool you know weekend trip to plan with your friends, or whether that's you know. To helping to change how people learn around the world, teach around the world. Like, if you do something meaningful, you're gonna, you're, it's gonna going to be a lot easier to attract other people. Um, and if you're passionate about it, that will, that'll be, you know, something that's, you know, very, you know, almost impossible to fake, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, find something meaningful, be passionate about it. Oftentimes, you'll be like a magnet. You'll just try to attract people in and work on big problems. I think that's another thing too that that I've really tried to to encourage other people that I know to think about is like, you know, what are the big kind of challenges that people face in their lives, you know, to the extent that you can build something that helps people with that, again, it'll be really easy to attract people to uh, to come in alongside you. So, um, why it's good to be obsessed. So, why is it good to be obsessed? <laughs> well, if you think about competition and, you know, the competitive landscape, if you're not obsessed, chances are all of your other competitors are obsessed and that's definitely not going to give you the upper hand. So, if you're, you know, going to make a startup of, of some sort and you don't have the true passion to it, I think, you know, that will be a, a big challenge for you. Um, I know maybe obsession isn't the right word. <laughs> no, I think obsession But I think word. it's great to be obsessed. Yeah. <laughs> because then, you know, you, you know that you are ahead in the space in some ways because you live that life. You are com completely committed to it and you really want to do, you know, a greater good and help whatever industry or, yep. you know, service that you're, you're building um, and help people. I think that's oftentimes the, the end goal. You just want to do something and build maybe an internet treasure like totally. uh, Mark Pincus from Zenga, huh. he, he mentioned that. And, you know, wouldn't that be great, like, to, to build something everlasting and, you know, you can be obsessed all your life with it. Totally. <laughs> that would be awesome. Totally. Yeah, it's, it's really fun. I think that the, um, you know, that's the great thing about being an entrepreneur is you can look at what you've built and you can say, you know, that would not have existed without me. And mm -hmm. I think that that's something that, that, you know, oftentimes if you work in a big company, even if it's a really cool big company like Google, like you kind of have that feeling of, well, if I wasn't here, you know, things would kind of go on without me. They'd find someone else to replace me. This would still get done. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're an entrepreneur, you can look back and you can be like, yeah, like Skimble wouldn't exist if I didn't have this idea and this passion for it. And Jufire wouldn't exist if I didn't have this passion for it. So you really do have a lot of satisfaction knowing that you brought something to life and kind of, um, 
you know, in fact, I think that's the definition of inspiration is like to breathe life into something. And that's, mm -hmm. that's really what you're doing as an entrepreneur is you're breathing life into something and also inspire other entrepreneurs. I mean, there'll be people who will, you know, be in college and they'll come across a cool website and they'll be like, wow, I'd love to build something like this someday. So you're helping to kind of light a spark, I think, with other people too. Mm -hmm. So it really does have a lot of benefits. And, and I think that at the end of the day, like, you know, I always think a lot about like the rocking chair of when I'm 80 years old, I'm sitting in a rocking chair, you know, I'm going to look back on my life and I'll be like, you know, what did I do with it? You know, when did I do it? Did I spend my entire life like, you know, doing kind of some, you know, meaningless big company job or did I, you know, do what I was really passionate about? Did I do something meaningful? Did I work for a company that was helping make people's lives better? Um, you know, I think that's something that we're all going to think about, but most of us don't think about when we're in our 20s and 30s. So if you can think about it now and really kind of use that to frame, you know, your thoughts around what you're going to do with the rest of your life. I think it's really impactful. So we're almost at 2.30. Um, wanted to see if there are any last questions that anybody had or if anybody wants to hop up on audio or video and you've done it before and you want to raise your hand and join us uh, on screen or at least on mic, um, you're welcome to do that. But we'll take a few more questions here before we wrap for the day. And for those of you who haven't seen already, uh, in, the, in the notes on the right there, we've got the websites, but uh, skimble.com, as I mistype it. And what's your, what are you on Twitter? It's Maria L-Y. Maria L-Y. And do you have a, is there a, a Skimble account as well? Um, skimble.com people. No. Oh, I'm sorry, the Twitter.com, Twitter, Twitter. Oh, SKMBL. SKMBL, so Twitter, I have to do this. SKMBL, cool. Mm -hmm. Cool. And you, you guys, guys are EduFire, right? On we're all, all of it? we're EduFire, 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 <laughs> EduFire. Just type EduFire into anything and it, it'll produce us. And of course, I am. Twitter.com slash John Bishke. And also, if you guys like some of the stuff we talked about today, you may like my blog. I haven't updated it very frequently as of late because we've been really busy with the site, but I've got some some stuff there about entrepreneurship, and, uh, and it's kind of geared really towards an audience of people that might be thinking about becoming entrepreneurs. So there's a whole, uh, whole boatload of links for y'all. <laughs> Cool. Well, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up if no one else has any questions, other questions. Um, thank you guys all so much for coming today. There'll be the recording of this class will show up in your account. So if you want to go back and re-listen to anything, you're welcome to. And, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to us as well. And otherwise, best of luck with uh, pursuing your passion mm -hmm. and becoming an entrepreneur, just pursuing your passion uh, through whatever whatever other channels you want to pursue it through. And uh, we've enjoyed uh, sharing our lives with you. Oh, go ahead, Ashok. Quickly, though. <laughs> I don't want to rush, but... <laughs> yeah. The world's watching you type a shock. The culture. Yeah, well, and feel free to elaborate if you want, Ashok, but one of the things, too, that's probably different a little bit is that um, I know in, in the U.S. in particular, you know, people are very forgiving of entrepreneurs who, who try and do not succeed mm -hmm. um, versus I know I've only really heard this, haven't experienced it firsthand, but in, like, Europe, for instance, um, you know, oftentimes the, uh, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you don't succeed, you're kind of branded as a failure and you can't even start another company again, um, so... But the question looks like it's a little bit different, which is on what values the team depends on, how to build or sustain it. That's a really that's a that's a really good question. I'm not sure there's a real short answer to that. Um, you know, I think that a lot of times you have to look at at making sure that everyone understands what you're doing as a company and why you're doing it. Um, I think that's oftentimes where people will get a little bit, you know, confused when they join an organization is that they don't really understand what are the, what are the motivations behind the people who are starting the company and the people that are calling the shots. Um, so I do think that it's, it's really good, you know, to, when you join a company or you're thinking about joining a company or you're thinking about joining a startup to really kind of get kind of um, underneath the surface and, and really try to 
you know, come to the you know, grips with the motivations behind why is this company being started or why does this company exist? Because if you understand the motivations, then all the actions then make a lot more sense. But if you don't understand the motivations, a lot of things can, can be confusing. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Um, I think one thing that we, we have in the back of our minds all the time is our mission. Um, you know, we want to inspire active lifestyles. And if you, you know, start with one or two people to build your business, okay, that's great. But when your company does grow, I think, um, you know, no matter what, everyone should be kind of aware and familiar with um, the mission. And, you know, you want to bring on people that, you know, aspire to the same. Mm -hmm. So even if you're doing day-to-day -day tasks, you know, um, to build and sustain, you know, a really um, good startup um, culture is to have the values in place and, you know, whether that be on the boards or, you know, the environment, mm -hmm. um, make that creative. Um, definitely people should know the values, should know the mission, and should believe it too. Yeah, completely agree. I hope that helps you answer your question, Ashok. Okay. <laughs> and there's there's a lot of stuff out there. I mean, it's one of yeah. those things we could spend a whole class talking about talking about that. Um, there's some good examples. I would definitely check out. You know, things like uh, uh, Zappos. Um, mm -hmm. Netflix had a really good PowerPoint presentation recently that was circling around the internet. There's a lot of uh, a lot of good examples out there. Company Southwest Airlines has done a fantastic job building a really good corporate culture. Mm -hmm. So you know, look at those examples, learn from them, and I think that that is something you can you can spend a lot of time on. It's time well spent. Cool. So we're going to go ahead and wrap. Thank you guys so much for having us, and uh, and we'll see you guys again on Edu Fire here real soon. Yeah. Pursue your passion. Pursue your passion.